So I, I neglected to mention, I'm Wes, I'm the board secretary. We're in the process, for those of you who aren't um, who are, uh, attending all the time, we're in the process of bringing in new pastors. We've recently sent our pastors, uh, two of our pastors up north, and um, the rest of our pastoral staff this morning is actually in Oklahoma City. Um, all but, I think Johnny's coming in, in it for a moment, but they're all, they're all at, a, um, at a conference of young clergy uh, that's meeting there for, for the Nazarene. So it's um, us, me, I'm, a, I'm an amateur, these guys aren't. Uh, amateurs running this. Um, this. This is also not an amateur. Uh, this morning, Aaron Jalovec is my friend, and he's also um, a, a preacher. Um, he, he came out to California because the Lord called him out for our blessing. He used to run up 1,400 foot peaks in Colorado, which is where he met his wife. Uh, Tiffany, oh, who's over here? Lovely Tiffany. They were, they were both working in international missions. She was working uh, with a program to help Syrian refugees uh, out of Greece. Um, and um, and they're both, they had been with the Christian Missionary Alliance. Um, they've, they've come and settled at our church, uh, which they now call home, which is a blessing to us. Aaron is um, going to preach to us this morning, and I would I'd have you come up. Do I pray over you for a moment before you go, if that's okay? All righty. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I love it. I know Aaron does. He's a man who calls himself a nerd. And um, he's a man who uh, posted a picture of uh, the Hebrew text of the Tanakh on Facebook yesterday while he was preparing for this word, God. I love that about him. He's, he's a studier. He's a lover of you in the text. Two things. I, I, I got prayer, which I love, and a back rub, which I also love, which Wes was doing this unintentionally knowing that I, I enjoy that. So um, thank you. Uh, I need to, forgot to grab this and drag this over. So that way I can work the PowerPoint, which I'm, oh, thank you. I'm like, I know it's here somewhere, just not. There we go. Beautiful. No. Awesome. Thank you, Muse. So first off, thank you, Wes, um, for the introduction. We didn't, first off, I want to say we didn't meet on a 14,000-foot peak. My wife didn't run up those. Only I did very crazily. Um, I actually had a friend call me crazy for doing that. And I said, but I love it. I actually love putting my body through pain. I don't know why that is. I've wondered, and I don't like poke myself with needles pain, but the, the process of running is very enjoyable to me. So when people talk about they're doing this marathon for the water, I'm doing it for the water, but I'm also doing it because I love running. So I get a, a double whammy, if you will. And I, I I also want to thank you, and Johnny's not here, but he'll see this later, I'm sure. Um, thank him for putting me in this process of preaching through this series at a place me and my wife call home. But let's pray real quick. Oh Lord our God, you have chosen to make yourself known through your creation, your word, your son, and your spirit. Now reveal your glory to us and through us to the church. Speak to us, form us, lead us, dwell in us. Teach us today to love as Jesus loves, to welcome the stranger, heal the sick, and care for the poor, to bear good news, to build bridges, and to bring your people home. 
For Christ in us is the hope of glory. May your perfect will prevail in us this day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For many years in, in, in my life, and, and here's to give you a background for some of you that don't know, Wes knows because of a group we're in, a couples group we're in. Um, others of you also know because of a couple group, couples group we're in. Um, but my voice is not my voice. My background is not the prettiest. My background is one of drugs, alcohol, you know, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing. My, my background is one of stealing, lying, and cheating because of voices I listened to. Now, now, not psychotic voices. I didn't end up in a home for that stuff. That's not the voices I'm getting at. The voices I'm getting at is my flesh, my sinful nature, Satan, who I believe actually put me in positions because I actually pulled a knife on my sister and tried to kill her. Fortunately, my friend threw me through a screen out the back door and said, get out of here. And my sister didn't say anything because she knew my dad would kill me. And not only did she know my dad would kill me, he'd kill me and then call the police on me. <laughs> but he knew that was good, would have been good for me. Or he actually thought it would have been good for me, whether it really would have, probably not. But also the world, because I fell into the wrong crowd. But like I said, I fell into heavy drugs and alcohol. And I got to the point of hearing the lies of stealing and cheating, which is a very bad thing. But ultimately, I share this because that's who I was. That's who I listened to, and that's how bad I got. But that's also to the point that it led me to use of heroin. Not because I'm, I, oh, I was this bad guy, or oh, I'm, I was this horrible person. That's not what I'm looking to get across. What I'm looking to get across is the voices I listened to were not good. They were not healthy, they were not helpful. But who I listened to, who I heard, and who I followed made all the difference in the world. And there's some kids that just made bad mistakes. And that's what I hope for my daughter. She just makes mistakes, because everybody does. We still make mistakes. Even as a new creation, we make mistakes. But the series we're in, Who, is, is, is something I've, I've, I've thought about. It's a series we're in, of course, but the, the, the word who has been constantly on my mind all week. And it's something I've thought and prayed about over this past week of, of expanding on just the word who. Because people can get stuck on, oh, it's a band from the 70s. <laughs> the Who. It's not just a, I mean, it is just a band from the 70s, but the sermon series is much more than that. Because one question kept, or one group of questions, I should say, kept coming to my mind over and over and over. There's three questions. Who do you follow? Who do you listen to? And who do you hear? And those three questions, keep those in mind because those are three questions in different ways I'm going to continue to reference and I'm going to bring back, come back to. Because I think they're so pivotal, at least to what I'm going to say today and even in our daily lives as we leave here, as we sit and have lunch together, we have a love feast together. They're questions that we can even ask each other. And the season we're in is one calling ourselves back to who we are called to be and allowing that to flow, or everything else to flow from that, excuse me. If this happens, allowing who we follow, listen to, hear, to be that thing where everything else flowed from, our Bible studies, our outreaches, even this pastoral search, then it does a beautiful thing. It has greater meaning because the meaning is the gospel. It's the kingdom of God. But it impacts the world in ways that no other 
nonprofit, no other program, no other people group can do because it's converted whole cultures and no nonprofit's ever done that. As good as they are and helpful as they are of getting kids off the street. All I have to say is all of Europe for hundreds of years was Christian. All of parts of Asia, the underground church in China was impactedly huge just because of the gospel. I was fortunate I had a roommate in college that was impacted by the underground church. And he told me all about it and I'm just like, we need that in America. <laughs> and he said, yes, we do. But as we look at our identity in being God's people as who we are seen by others, we are trying to bring some refocus. We're trying to kind of, kind of check ourselves. I don't know if anybody plays basketball, but you check the ball before you go in when you play half court. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to check the ball. It's getting ready to go for a basket. This past Tuesday, I used a, a good time of my morning to, to get ready for today. And, and as I left my house, my wife, Tiffany, said two things to me. Really one thing, but ultimately I, I kind of heard them as two separate things. She said, make sure you hear what God wants, but make sure you listen to what he wants. Make sure you listen to him and make sure you hear him. She said them completely separate. And as I left the house, I'm just like, yes, because I'm so good at just sitting down, opening up scripture, looking at the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew text, the Hebrew Bible, looking at Greek, mainly um, with help because I don't know Greek, but, and just, just learning words and deciphering words and parsing whole sentences. But it made me sit back and ask the question daily, God, expand on who for me? And this was immense in preparation. This was huge in preparation. But it's even bigger in our daily lives. I see this because, I'm, like I said, I'm good at doing things without slowing down. And her phrase, her questions, her, her statements, rather, helped me slow down for this sermon. And I was actually done with my sermon by Saturday. I was like, whoa, something happened here. I got out of the way. That's what happened. Now, I still revised it and changed things, but it was like 95% done on Friday. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on? I didn't even have to work Friday night or Saturday. I could just hang out. And then I started looking up some words and so on and so forth and decided to geek out on Hebrew. But the overall series, the overall passage, excuse me, for the series is from Ezekiel, chapter 36. It says, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands. Real quick, if anybody's able to help Abner, you could... Real quick, just take a few minutes. Thanks, guys. And any ladies that decide to go. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cleanse you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I have given your father, your forefathers, your forefathers. So you will be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleansiness, and I will call for, for the grain and multiply it. And I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. And this passage is, is the passage for this series. Johnny talked about it last week. 
And God is calling his people back to their land, back to obedience, and back to himself. And that's kind of the the heart of what we're hoping with this. And that's what you're going to continually hear over the, I think, three more weeks. Five weeks total is in just different thrusts, different focuses of God calling himself back and who we are and who God is and how that plays out and how we, we, we get readjusted. Now, I want to talk about a few things that kind of led Israel to this point. I, I'm convinced through Scripture that Israel was an unsure, unsure and an insecure people. All we need to do is go back to Moses and the Red Sea because they thought they led him out. He led them out to die. I don't know about you, but if I stood at a sea and somebody was, there was people behind me chasing me and this big piece of water in front of me and the guy led me there and said, well, God did this. I'd be like, dude, you sure? You're nuts. I mean, I would be unsure about this guy. I would be a little insecure about the situation. In the desert, Israel made an idol while Moses was up on a mountain. They made a golden calf. A few times in Exodus, it says they were unsure of Moses leading them. They followed Aaron's leadership instead of Moses' as God said, follow Moses. They worshipped an idol, unsure of who God called them to be. Let's go just a bit further. One of my favorite books in the Tanakh in the Old Testament is the book of Judges. But it's one of the most heavily text book-wise, one of the most heavily laid out books of the Israel's disobedience to God. Because they disobey God, God raises a judge, they start to obey God because of the judge, and they go right back to disobedience. And the cycle in the book of Judges is there. And that's all it is. But guess what? It's because of what they followed, not who they followed. They followed a statute. They followed the Torah. They followed the five books of Moses. They followed the law. They were stuck on a what and not who God was. Not the I am that I am. Not the Lord Almighty. Who did they follow? Did they really follow this continual thought of God does this, God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this? this." No, they were continually stuck on the what? But let's think about us real quick. Let's kind of pull it back in. It's easy to look at somebody else and say, look how they messed up. Look how they did wrong. I, I can do that very easily. It, it makes me feel so much better. But I have to look continually at myself. Who you follow makes all the difference. All the noise in the world, all the noise of the devil, all the noise of people in our lives can turn us from God. Now bear with me. I'm big on community. I wrote or almost finished a book about community, about Christian community. So I'm not discrediting community and discrediting counsel. There is, there is wisdom in a multitude of counsel, Proverbs says. So there is that, and that's good. But caution must be thrown to the wind. And I'm coming from that from experience because I was dating a girl. It got really serious and we got engaged. We were planning a wedding. I had people in my life say, go for it. Keep going. It's godly. Marriage is godly. You guys are da, 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 da. You guys are you're filling the blank. Everything's good. It wasn't perfect. 
But that, that process of following community led me to have a broken heart. Led me to the point of arguing with God and telling God I hate you for three months because you did this to me. You did this. I followed you and you did this. Well, guess what? I listened to people, not God, when I look back. When I wrote my journal for three months, I still have that journal and that journal is never gonna get thrown away because it's a point in my life where I listened to people and I didn't listen to God. And that messed with me. That hurt me and it can hurt anybody. Jesus understood this because there's a point in John 6, verse 15, where it says they wanted to make him king after he did all these things. And Jesus withdrew because he understood they wanted to make him king. He knew what the Father wanted because he understood the Father. He understood this, this relationship that he goes and hears God first that he goes and hears his father first. He doesn't do what the world wants. Christian marriage is good. God's at the center, make room for the Holy Spirit, so on and so forth. I thought I was doing that, but God wasn't at the center. When we hear a voice that is not of God, but an outside source, or when we hear anything other than God, we bite the bait of the devil and our flesh loves it. Because good thing can be bad for you. We also accept what the world says about God because we start, we, we start believing what other people say what other er, thoughts are outside of what God says. So I ask again, who do you follow? Who do we follow? And this kind of leads me the, 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 into to what Jesus teaches talks about and thinks about what scripture says in John 10. And if you have um, your Bible or your phone or one under the seat, open to John 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 18. It's a lengthy passage, so I didn't want to do a, poem, a screenshot of it up on the, the PowerPoint. says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who enters, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what these things, what these things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He, is a, he who is a hired hand and not the shepherd he is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. 
I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will, be, uh, and they will become one flock, excuse me, with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life, so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. This commandment I have received from my Father. Hey, can I have a green bottle right there? I'm sorry, I dried my mouth out by reading that. <laughs> This verse has so much packed into it. There's so much going on, so many analogies, and, and so many big implications. that This passage shows us just a bit of how Israel would understand a shepherd in a Near Eastern culture or a Palestinian culture. We think about it and we're like, well, you got a dog. What do you need a shepherd for? That's because we shepherd sheep different than they shepherd sheep. The shepherd shepherds, not the dog. They would understand the going in and out, the manner of leading, the thieves and robbers, and even the rod the shepherd uses and what he uses it for, and the wolves, and how they would attack and, 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 and split up the sheep and so on and so forth. The two greatest implications for us that I want to touch on specifically, because I could sit and just talk about this and just the background for about a half hour, and, and there's a lot there. And I don't want to hear in 10 minutes. So this section of scripture is the shepherd that I want to talk about is leading and calling the sheep and the sheep being hearing and following. Because guess what? Sheep follow. That's their thing. That's what sheep do. They don't know much more than that other than eating. They follow. So they either follow their shepherd or they follow something else. The passage talks about the shepherd calling the sheep and the sheep listening, knowing personally by the call. Remember, sheep follow. The, some of the coolest things of this, this background, this passage, and, and they would understand, the sheep would know their shepherd personally by the call. And the shepherd has a personal call or a specific call to his flock. Sometimes shepherds would even have specific calls that would extend beyond the flock call two specific sheep. That's how personal the shepherd gets with the sheep. The sheep wouldn't follow another shepherd, even if it's so specific you can't tell by a human ear. Shepherds would be able to tell because that's their deal, that's their thing. We, everyday normal people, would not be able to tell. We wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a and a, which sound really similar. All I did was do a slight pitch in the first one at the end of the whistle. I only knew that. Maybe you heard it. I don't know. But it didn't seem very different. That could be as similar or as to a T the difference in the calls, but the sheep would know of specific flocks because they would be kept together at night in the same pen. And usually it was a, a big cave or an alcove that they had a big rock they rolled in front, into to block them in, basically, or some type of covering that they would um, be in from, to keep from the elements. 
The wolves also come and snatch, scatter the flock. They're good at scattering the little ones. They come specifically to get the yinglings, to get the babies. That's what they go for. They go for the young sheep. So simply put, throughout all of Scripture... The Tanakh says, or the Old Testament says, the Lord is my shepherd. And John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. It's a flowing theme throughout passage of God is the shepherd, the people of God are the sheep. It's a flowing thought. It's not talked about as much as other things, but it's still the thought that when you see the sheep, they're the people of God. The shepherd is God. As we, we kind of cover back over the verse, the, the, the John 10, I just want to stick with the first six verses primarily because there's a whole lot going on, like I said. But remember the question I asked earlier of who do you follow, who do you hear, and who do you listen to? Well, Jesus basically asks the same thing, or he brings up the same thing. Because listening and hearing, these all lead into following. With the season we're in as, an, as individuals within a church that are going through a process of following new leaders, finding new leadership, and what that leadership's going to look like, and so on and so forth, and not having somebody in leadership, but, you know, Wes is kind of the go-to guy right now, and, you know, there's so much going on, it's easy to, to, to get distracted, But we must ask, ultimately, who do we follow? Ultimately, who do we follow? I'm going to say that a whole lot because it's a question that I don't want to get construed. We need to understand that following the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, is the only way that we will truly bring glory to God's kingdom. It's the only way. Everything else, everything else will look to us. And I don't want to be the one to be thought about, honestly. I want people to be like, oh, John 10, da, 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 da. Who talked about it? I don't know. Good, I don't care. I don't want people to remember me. I mean, I do. Don't get me wrong. I don't want my wife to forget about me if I pass on. I just realized that it wasn't probably the best. I want people to, pass, to remember me. Don't get me wrong. But in the sense of God's kingdom and doing things, I don't want Aaron Jalabek to be the center point, center point. Ezekiel and John both touch on the heart of God for drawing people into his fold and listening to his voice. Ezekiel says, I will take a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh to obey and follow. John says the shepherd calls his sheep, and his sheep know him, and follow and obey. It's very interesting how they're very similar and very close to the implications and to what they're getting at. Because Ezekiel talks about blessing then, and guess what? When we follow, Jesus says, I will give you an abundant life. The word abundance at the very root talks about blessing. Very interesting. The shepherd calls the sheep, the sheep come, but only to him. The thief comes in up, up into the pen, up over. Two separate words up over into the pen and doesn't enter by the gate. He climbs in and the sheep won't come to him. But he does scatter the sheep. He does scatter the flock. And just because you don't hear him doesn't mean he's not trying to scatter other people or scatter other 
people, you know, uh, other situations or a ministry here just because you're not part of that ministry. That's why prayer for the church is so huge. It's the center point of the work of God's people, and multiple theologians have said that. Martin Luther, A.W. Tozer, George Whitfield. I think somebody else said it, the founder of the Nazarene Church said it. I don't know who that is. But there's multiple people that have said that prayer is the primary work of God's people. But what does this mean for us here? Remember, I asked the question, and I was asking at the beginning that my prayers and my thoughts took me to, that my wife asked me, and I really, I love my wife, and I don't say this because she is my wife, but I love her because she always says little tidbits here and there, and I'm just like, dang it, God, because she just kind of unknowingly smacks me up the backside of my head without even getting out of a chair. I don't know if other men have that issue. It's a good issue, by the way. Because my wife hears God and doesn't even know it sometimes. Because she's speaking right to me, or should I say, he's speaking right to me through my wife. It's really hard to take some days. But who do you follow? Who do you listen to? And who do you hear? Because you can listen to anybody. You can hear anything. You can follow whatever the heck you want. I specifically say those three words separately because following is a choice. You choose to follow something. Listening and hearing, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting into Webster's dictionary, so I'm gonna define these as Webster sees them. Webster says listen is gives one attention to a sound. So it's as though, you know, somebody out in the courtyard bangs something on the ground and I go whoop and it distracted me. I gave my attention to it. Hear means preserve with the ear a sound made. Means I just, ah, eh, whatever, I don't care. I heard it, but it's not distracting me. There's a movie that I really like. It's not the best movie to watch, but White Men Can't Jump. I was gonna show a clip, but there were a few words that I wasn't gonna share. I won't also share them, but the movie goes, it's two gentlemen, Woody Harrelson, Wesley Snipes, Rosie Perez is Woody Harrelson's girlfriend. And at the beginning of the movie, Woody Harrelson, um, drawing blank on the word, he, uh, he what? No, he, he cheats him. He basically hustles him. Thank you, I, think I found it myself. He hustles him. He, he gets one over on him. And through the process of the movie, they start to become partners to hustle other people. And as they're driving in their car, they're talking about the money they just made because of basketball, they hustled somebody. And this is, takes place in South Central Los Angeles, so it's not good. They are in Watts, they're in Compton, they're in South Central. These are not good neighborhoods, and this takes place back into the early 90s. So it's really not a good neighborhood. And the movie, the, the scene is that they're just sitting there and they're excited and they're playing, and they're, they're, they're kind of getting and going and, and excited for the next time and talking about how they were, they're the best since the guys they name are, were the best in the area. And Woody Harrelson pops in the tape and it's Jimi Hendrix. The black guy, African-American guy. Or I found out, I guess he's mixed. I didn't, I, my wife told me that, I didn't know that. But anyways, his band was white. And Woody Harrelson kind of, they were going back and forth, him and Wesley Snipes. And Wesley Snipes was kind of like, why are you listening to this? And he was upset because it wasn't a white guy he was listening to. And Woody says, well, why? I can listen to him. And Rosie Perez kind of says, yes, he can listen to him. And they kind of banter back and forth and talk about, oh, he's, you know, 
he's not a white guy and so on and so forth. And he gets to the point of hearing and listening. Wesley Snipes said, well, you hear him, but you don't listen to him. And the point he was making is he hears the music, but he doesn't hear the heart. The heart of what Jimmy is saying, Woody Harrelson can't get because he's not black, because he's not African-American. And the point I'm making is that's the difference between the words is by hearing we're taking on the heart of the issue. I can just, just noise in the background. But if I take the noise in the background and I do something with it, then I'm going to follow that noise because I'm going to be like, oh, wait, what's going on out there? I've done it multiple times. You kind of like you're curious as to what's going on. Now, in the long run, there's outside noises. There's noises that we hear, but what are you doing with them? How are you taking them and adjusting to them? Remember that, who do you follow? Who do you listen to? Who do you hear? Now this question I've been asking myself every day this week, those three questions, I've been, as I've been praying and preparing to stand before you and preach this message. And, and I've been on the edge of my seat all week as I think about this pivotal moment for where we're at and even where I'm at in life. Because it looks at the very heart of God for God's people's heart. For the heart of God's people. If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. But this plays into who you are because who you follow reveals who you are. Very much so. There's a couple more scriptures, some, uh, some scriptures that I want to touch on real quick about following. Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. And Paul is a rabbi. And Paul is a rabbi understood what it was like to be a student under a rabbi. Now, in the time of Paul and Jesus were around, the rabbinical customs was, as a follower of rabbi, you would imitate them to a T. So much that you would walk, talk, and sit like them. Some students were even known to eat what their rabbis ate and mimic them. They would walk like in a line and they would step in their footprints just to be so much like their rabbi. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This following aspect is exactly who Jesus was. He made, he made men, real men and women. And he intended to do that with the disciples. Verse 10 of John chapter 10 says, I came that they have life. They may have life and have it to the full or have it in abundance. But the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy. There's the shepherd and the sheep and the wolf coming in to do what he does. A great example of the sheep and the shepherd and the shepherd leading is from Psalms 23. I'm going to just kind of do a quick synopsis. Is Psalms 23 talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters and leads me into green pastures. And in Palestine, in still waters, there is parasites that grow within those still waters. And if sheep actually drink from still waters, the parasite will go up their nose into their brain and kill the sheep. Now, the water looks very good to the sheep. They don't know any difference. They think it's good and healthy. But the shepherd understands, no, you can't drink that. You shouldn't drink that because it's going to kill you. How the shepherd does it, I don't know exactly how they would do it. Maybe yank them. Maybe just push them. 
but he'd lead them into green pastures. He led them by something that looked so good, but was actually going to kill them. And during this time, if we are looking to who we are as a church and the people of God, then I must continue to ask, who do we follow? Who are we following? Who are you following? There's three passages I wanted to touch on real quick that, that talk about things that we shouldn't be following. Because we, I've, I've mentioned over and over we should follow Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the one we follow. His voice we listen to. Well, guess what? There's other voices that we shouldn't follow. Satan, the world, and the flesh. Idolatry. Satan tried to do it to Jesus. He's definitely going to try to do it to us. Matthew 4. The devil took him to a very high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to me, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The world, stuff, money, so on and so forth. Ecclesiastes 5.10 he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Now notice it says love money. Not just have money. Love money. Got to keep that in mind. The flesh, self-desires. Romans 7.20 But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Because guess what? Even in a redeemed body, being sanctified and working through the process of sanctification, body, soul, and spirit, 1 Thessalonians, we still live in a flesh because that word flesh in that passage means limbs. It means, means physical. It means this, hands. It means toes, feet. Things of that nature. That's how the passage, that's the word, what the word means in those passages in that passage, in that section of Romans 7. But those scriptures are not who we are. Who we follow is. And I want to ask one final thing and remind us of one final thing. So really two. Who are we following? The world, the flesh, Satan, or the Lord Jesus? Because we all have struggles Remember, our identity is who we are. For that comes from who we follow, who we identify with. Because who you follow identifies you as to who you are. If you line up with who the Lord Jesus is, his teachings, listening to the, to the, to the work of the Spirit, having fellowship and strong communion and good counsel, Your life's not going to be perfect, don't get me wrong. Everything's not going to go to a T every second. But you will be doing your darndest, your best, to follow the Good Shepherd, to listen to him and not these outside voices, not these voices that will steer you. I don't know about you, but as I stand here, and I'll close with this, and I think about this past week, and I think about all the things that, 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 that I have wrestled with in my life, my life has stunk sometimes. I've been in situations where I've had to work 10, 12, 15 hour days, five, six days a week, which is actually what I'm doing right now, and I don't like it. 
but I still try to make room. I know some people have all the free time in the world, and that's great. I get in trouble with that. <laughs> that's where I get into trouble. But making time, and, and I guess that's where I want to challenge us, is taking even two minutes and saying, what do you want today, God? Or 20 minutes. Or opening scripture and reading one proverb and just meditating on that throughout the day. It doesn't have to be a lot. Sending, you know, me and, and, and a couple other guys, Wes and, and Abner and Jesse, have this text group going on and I love it because it keeps me on track and it checks me. And I never would have had it if Abner had not broken it, brought it up during Advent. We just kept it rolling. So I challenge you to even do that. Maybe you just meet people if you're not tech savvy and you don't care about texting. Meet at a coffee shop. Get some tea. I don't know. Whatever. Hang out. Just chat once a week. But I just want to challenge us to do that. Because if we're following anybody but the Good Shepherd, we're doing a disservice to the kingdom of God. And it's going to end up showing us and not God.